Welcome to People Force Podcast by Trinet. I'm your host, Michael Mendenhall. Trinet is a full service HR solutions company committed to empowering small to medium sized businesses by supporting their growth and enabling their people. We work with amazing small to medium sized businesses, and I'm so excited to bring their voices to life right here. You can catch new episodes of People Force Podcast every month on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and rise.trinet.com. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Adler, CEO and founder of Zap Surgical Systems. Dr. Adler is a pioneer and world-renowned inventor of the CyberKnife and the related field of image-guided therapeutic radiation. While creating the CyberKnife, Dr. Adler founded Accurate in 1992 to commercialize this invention. Up until 2009, he served in varying roles at Accurate, including CEO, Chief Medical Officer, and Chairman. To date, Accurate technology has been used to treat more than tens of thousands of patients, and the most modern radiation equipment now incorporates Dr. Adler's basic idea of image-guided targeting. Since 2015, he has served as the founder and CEO of Zap Surgical Systems, Dr. Adler's use of technology-based treatment for neurosurgery is paving the way for the future of brain surgery. Dr. Adler has served on the faculty at Stanford University for over 35 years, being appointed the Dorther and T.K. Chan Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology in 2007. He is the author and or co-author of more than 300 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. He served or has served on editorial boards of eight different peer-reviewed journals. In 2009, Dr. Adler founded the Curious Journal of Medicine, which today is one of the largest medical journals in the world. Dr. Adler is also named an inventor on 20 patents. In 2002, Dr. Adler founded the CyberKnife Society, later in 2012 renamed Radio Surgery Society. He also served or has served on the scientific advisory boards of seven different medical device or pharmaceutical companies. Thank you, Dr. John Adler, for being with us today. We're so excited to have you here. So many new developments in this space. Uh, so welcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, so many people want to understand how you wound up getting into a profession. When did that start? Uh, why? Um, and then we'll, we'll sort of progress through. So when did you know you wanted to get into the medical profession? Um, not too well into college. Um, I hadn't given that much thought about uh, what my life work would be. Uh, but it was uh, interesting times in the early 70s, and there was a lot of unemployment. And a lot of young people today have no idea what it was like to come out of college and and not be able to get a job. And I don't think I was worried about being employed, but I was mindful that the economy it was a different time. And having spent a lot of money in an expensive education at Harvard, I wanted to make sure I was employed at the end of it. And I was just kind of a middle-class kid. And uh, and I love science. And uh, the, right, the small town I grew up in, the most respected guy in the town was the doctor. So that was the full extent of <laughs> the world I had lived in up to that point in time. And so uh, I kind of stumbled into medicine in some ways. Uh, and that has just been the ladder that's pulled me along for the last uh, 40 years of my life. Well, certainly you're inquisitive, um, and, and we're going to get to some of that. Did you, did you specialize right away, or as you got into the profession in undergrad, because you did both, I think, undergrad and your medical degree at Harvard, um, did you know you were going to get into neurosurgery and, and radiology? Oh, no, I had no idea. Um, again, I said the only doctor I knew in life was a small town general practice doctor in a, literally a town of a couple thousand people. So that was the full extent of what I knew about medicine. Unlike most people go to medical school, they're pretty sophisticated. A lot of times their parents are physicians. Um, they know what they're getting into. I really had no idea. So again, it was just seemed like 
I was a dumb kid. Seemed like the right thing to do with a kid who liked the <laughs> science, especially biochemistry. Well, talk to me then when you began to specialize. So at what part in your career did you decide you were going to move in this direction uh, where you are today? Well, almost anybody who's a doctor can tell you that in the middle of medical school, there's this moment of self-reckoning and and everyone has to, you look in a mirror and you say, am I a surgeon or am I, not, am I an internist? And that's kind of the great dividing line of the medical community. Um, and it was clear that by personality, by instinct, I'm a surgeon. Most people think of it's in your hands and there's an element of that. You know, you, you, know, you can't be totally ham-handed, but um, uh, most of it is, is, do you have an instinct for action and, and are you kind of uh, as instinct for masochism because the hours are much longer in surgery? Um, and then uh, can you really handle the stress? Um, and you don't even fully realize that till you're well into your career. And so I knew right pretty well, midway through my medical my medical school training that I was a surgical temperament, and there wasn't, wasn't much doubt about it. And uh, I gravitated towards the surgeons that I had worked with and uh, ran as fast as I could away from the world of internal medicine, despite my utter respect for the people in the field, including my own brother so, and daughter. <laughs> oh, right. oh, wow. Uh, so so as, as you got into this field, um, you wound up, after some time, going back to becoming a professor at Stanford, um, certainly in this field, what led you to move from what was probably real-time surgery, which you probably still may be doing, to uh, teaching and professing? Well, you need a job, so I had, you know, you know, the neurosurgical training process is long and arduous, and most of your listeners may be horrified to realize it's, it's literally 15 years. So from the moment you first step foot in college to the time you're, you're prepared to be a licensed neurosurgeon is 15 years. And even then, there's a couple more years after that before you're what we call board certified. So it's a very, very long process. And, um, you know, when I got done after 15 years of training especially a guy that had a couple kids, you know, you need a job and you got to get paid. And there is a, again, another major decision point in every physician's career. I mean, what are you going to do with yourself as a, as a doctor? And um, I had options to uh, go to a large community hospital and operate in those large community hospitals and just be a practicing neurosurgeon, something that I have a lot of respect for. But I had some big dreams around inventing what I hope would become the future of neurosurgery, and, and I still believe today the future of all surgery. And those dreams were just too big to pass up. And although I would have made a lot more money right out, certainly out of the gate, going to becoming a regular neurosurgeon, a uh, regular, just a pra community practicing neurosurgeon, I chose the what we call the academic route. And then the academic route, you have to find to find the right medical school. And uh, I was very fortunate to end up at Stanford because I know my life would have probably turned out very differently if not for Stanford University. Well, so so well, first you you have changed many lives, and you certainly have innovated, and we're we're going to get to that. Um, so it certainly seems like you know a wonderful path in that you you really have you know changed this world. Sure. Um, uh, and, and in a very positive way. And I think what's so interesting is when you think about Stanford University and how they cross-pollinate uh, the different sort of academia within um, the university. So what I mean by that is you, you sort of have the medical profession, but you have engineering. Um, you, you have all of these different industries uh, where people are excelling and they cross fertilize the information. And I think you you started down that path because you worked with the engineering team in developing some of these new technologies. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely right. And that's 
kind of why I said Stanford was so special in my professional career. I think it would have been hard to do a lot of what I'd done in the past in almost any other um, medical school, many university. Uh, and it, and, but I also have to give a shout out to Silicon Valley as well, uh, which is, of course, you know, so, the genesis of which was Stanford, but now it's its own little world in addition, because there's a lot of technologies and engineering talent and practical talent. You know, I mean, universities are very good at, at thinking big ideas and writing papers about it, but it's a very big step between going from that to a real world invention that impacts patients' lives. And there's a lot of that latter capacity here in Silicon Valley. So I really have relied on both of those throughout my career. And in doing that, um, like many small businesses, uh, many of who hope will watch or listen to this podcast, you know, are in the same position you are, where they have big ideas that'll have great social impact, but they can't find funding or they're told it's too expensive. Um, we're not sure this will scale. Um, so there's a lot of doubt that surrounds some of that. Talk to us about your process of pitching your first sort of big idea, the cyber knife, and, and trying to get people to buy in because I think, and I believe historically, you had to rely on friends to help you fund the first iteration of this. Is, is that true? Um, it's very true. And of course, I have only my story to report. And uh, there are people who have had a much easier path than myself. But um, it, uh, I faced a lifetime of having most funding sources say no. And I don't mean just no once, but no hundreds, if not thousands of times. And so these are, you, know, you have to just have kind of a thick skin um, <laughs> and yet be really kind of committed to your cause. I, I I sometimes wonder if I need a sanity check to do what I've chosen to do because you just, <laughs> it's very discouraging uh, to repeatedly hear no. And I you know every now and then I hear some, you know, young startup person talk to me about how they've been rejected a few times and I almost have to kind of laugh it off. I mean, it is, it is, it is elemental to the entire life of startup life, especially if you're trying to do something important. Now, you know, if, if there's a big trend right now, maybe now the trend is AI. I'm not going to speak with confidence in that way, but, but you can jump onto that trend and you can then get the funding much more readily than if you're trying to, you know, ply waters that have are not well understood by the venture capital community. It's and they're very skeptical. The, the venture capital community is very herd herd mentality. You know, a few years ago it was fintech, then it was food delivery services. It's not just one. There's a whole herd of companies that move in that direction. But if you're doing important work, chances are you're not part of the herd. And that means people don't understand you. You're going to be rejected a lot. And uh, I was rejected a lot. In fact, I was universally rejected. Um, it was, <laughs> you know, none of the big name venture capitals here in Silicon Valley, including the healthcare group, which was quite robust at that time, uh, really would give me the time of day. They heard my story and said, thank you. We're not interested. And so I did... You know, one of the good things about neurosurgeons is they're well paid. And so neurosurgeons in the world who were my friends uh, were the foundation by which I uh, I put together the initial seed money to start the company. And it was kind of audacious, maybe crazy. Uh, it could have easily failed, but uh, by by luck or by skill or whatever, it worked. And you're, re you're referencing accurate. You're... You're, you're referencing Accurate? I'm starting by very much talking about Accurate, yes. So I want to do one step back, and, and, and I want them to understand this idea of the Gamma Knife, um, why and when you went abroad, and, and what you learned, um, and how you wanted to improve healthcare relative to um, this radiation therapy and the imaging around that. 
and and making it a lot more precise in what it delivers. Can you talk us through that piece of your career? Sure. Um, well, again, there was a lot of serendipity here. And at one point in my neurosurgery training, I needed to spend a year someplace and learn something new. And, and mostly by serendipity, by coincidence, I chose to go to uh, a place called the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, where they actually give out the Nobel Prizes, or that's why it's most famous for. But there was, a, there was a, a neurosurgery department there that I didn't know that much about, and I had two kids, and I wanted to live in a place where my kids could be supported, you know, and, and thought it might be an interesting place to spend a year. There was, again, not much thought given to it. Um, yeah, there's no there's no surfing there though. <laughs> no, there was no surfing, and it's cold <laughs> as hell. But it's uh, but yeah. I I went there expecting to become a better technical surgeon in the operating room, and I quickly fell in love with this idea of radio surgery. The founder of creator of which is a guy named professor there named Lars Lexell, which I had known nothing about beforehand, and it, the idea of the his creation, the gamma knife was that if you could focus enough tiny little beams of radiation on a target very precisely, you could kill that target and spare all the intervening normal tissue. And I liken this concept of radio surgery to a magnifying glass. Sunlight is not so powerful by itself, but if you put a magnifying glass interspersed that between the, the sunlight and the, the point in space, you can concentrate the energy and you can start fires or do, you know, it's a potent energy. And so he figured out the same way to do that with regular kind of penetrating radiation. Um, the, like the radiation they use in radiotherapy or the radiation they use to get your dental x-rays. And so it was a transformative idea and it is, in fact, totally changed the practice of neurosurgery over the last 35 years. And when I saw that, I wanted in. You know, I come from Harvard, and actually specifically, I'd been a, a resident at Mass General Hospital, and we refer to the Mass General Hospital as MGH, and the euphemism is it's man's greatest hospital, quote unquote. But you, I had bought into the, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid, and I thought I knew everything, and then I suddenly went to Sweden, and I realized that I knew nothing. The future of medicine was not what I'd been taught, but what I was witnessing at the Karolinska Institute. And patients that would spend sometimes weeks in the hospital were being treated as regular, almost outpatients in Sweden. And so I bought in, I fell in love, but I was also kind of a restless soul as I always have been and realized that as great as it was, maybe radio surgery could be better because the invention of the gamma knife required literally a frame screwed into the patient's skull. And it was a vice, basically a vice for the cranium. And I wanted to see if we couldn't do this without that vice, what we call image-guided radiation. And that was kind of my invention to the world, image-guided radiation, tar tarking very precisely inside the human body without frames attached to the skeleton. Wow. But, 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 and you've done amazing work here because you've developed that into the cyber knife and tens of thousands of patients have millions. used your technology millions, millions. probably probably millions millions and and life saving and you know i have to tell you being here in new york city they actually promote your product nyc langdon uses it to promote their hospital um and and so it is that prolific and 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 you've done amazing things but you haven't stopped there which i think is fascinating you're you're now moving moving that needle even further and i want you really to talk about now what you're doing today and the difference that's going to make well um the cyber knife proved a, a, an important tool in taking this precision radiation beyond what the gamma knife did in the brain and the cyber knife because of the general nature of its targeting could actually treat a tumor anywhere in the body and seemed like an amazing concept from my, my, my humble 
way of looking at it, but yeah. it was, um, um, and it, it, it has been very impactful in medicine. Uh, it's changed a lot, but I came to realize that nine out of 10 of the patients who would benefit from this type of treatment are not getting it today. That's probably worse than that. It's probably 95 out of 100 patients who would benefit do not get this wow. procedure. Now, maybe in America, it's only one in three or one in four not getting, but around the world, most patients are not getting. And I'd kind of given my life and sweat and toil to this field and yet had not had as much uh, uh, a benefit as I dreamed. And so I kind of gave myself a, my life a checkup, you know, probably about 15 years ago. And, and as proud as I was of what I had accomplished, I was dismayed I hadn't done more. And so I had to kind of fit, try to analyze what I had done and why it wasn't it more successful. And it's not because of the technology per se. The technology is very powerful. It has more to do with all the things that are visible to many patients. To They're visible to even much the word many people in the industry is what motivates doctors to treat with a procedure or not treat with it, what motivates a hospital to buy something. And unfortunately, it's not about outcomes. It's not about necessarily saving patients' lives. Unfortunately, it's too often it's about money, money and control. And uh -huh. man, well, I was, sad... I was, I, I was going to... In... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to interject there because I was going to say, do the carriers, you know, the healthcare carriers that carry the insurance, do they push back on this type of technology due to cost? Do they they say, no, it's not necessary, we're not going to approve this procedure? Oh, I could go on for days about all this issue, and I don't want to uh, bore you or get sidetracked, but uh, um, yes, yes, they sorry. do. They, they do, but ironically, this particular procedure is relatively inexpensive among all the different procedures in medicine. This procedure does not take a lot of in fact, that's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is it doesn't pay the hospital as much money as other procedures, and the hospitals and doctors often want to maximize their revenue by, by building more expensive procedures. As you know, some of these cancer drugs can be literally over $100,000, $200,000 a year, um, and this procedure is $10,000, $15,000. So it's... it's it's really in the noise, and that's one of the reasons so it's, it's developing scalable. countries love it. So it's scalable. Oh, for sure. utterly scalable, but there's yeah. an impediment up front. It costs millions of dollars to get started. And so what I try to do with my newest companies is try to, is try to break down that barrier to the initial development of a facility so that you could treat patients in the first place. So here you are developing new science uh, and new technology, uh, around the practice in medical, um, and yet you're running companies. I mean, your your company, your first company is now public. It's doing quite well. Um, you have another company that's a startup that you're you're involved with, where you're the actual CEO. You're actually managing the company, managing the innovation. Um, talk to me about how you balance all of that, um, and. One, where do you find people that buy into the idea? Because you have to buy into the mission of your company uh, and what it's doing. And is it difficult to find those people? Uh, yes. Uh, I, for the record, I, I was CEO of Accurate for three years as well. So I, I did manage the business there for a while. But, you, you know, companies go through this evolution. Um, and at the most embryonic phase, the first half dozen employees, it's a very different type of employee than what you hire six years or eight years later. Um, it was enormous risk up front, and it takes uh, a specifically intrepid individual who often get very bored inside big organizations who, who are willing to take the risk. I mean, very few employees are willing to take the risk at that earliest stage. And I think the good thing about Silicon Valley is we have a few more of those people to kind of get the business jump started. But that same sort of employee who's very good at getting things started, um, generally they're, they like a minimum of process 
and they just want to go fast. And God bless them, I love that. But after a few years, you've got to have, and you're starting to build a scalable business, you need a little bit more process. And of course, I'm in a heavily regulated industry, you know, medical devices for good reasons are, are uh-huh. carefully watched over by the FDA and others. So you, you, you have to pivot from employees who are just all risk, let's go fast, to employees who hopefully are still imaginative, still invaded, still passionate, but are, are more process, more tolerant of process. And then that's kind of what's happened to Zap. You know, as the business has grown, it's, it's the, those crazy entrepreneurial intrepid spirits have often moved on to other companies where they could be crazy entrepreneurial spirits. And a new group of more solid, grounded, deliberate employees have taken over. Hopefully everybody's bright, but just with a, a different kind of focus in their work. Have you had to pivot? So have you had to pivot in how you manage and how you lead uh, through that transition? Well, I have, and I'm you know, I'm still learning. I think you've always got to learn in life. And um, it's it's very painful to lose. I, I always take it personally when I lose an employee, you know, whether even if I'm the one who's initiating the change. But um, <laughs> I, I've matured to the point now that this is a necessary cycle in the evolution of a business. Um, and as much as I may miss or not miss an employee, I too have to adapt. And in fact, I have to embrace processes myself that uh, the, the disciplines that I need know are needed to grow a scalable business. Yeah, you know, we see so many of these small to medium-sized businesses look at sort of the benefit structures that you offer becoming more and more important. What's interesting is we're, we're now seeing that with the younger generations, the millennials and even some of the Gen Xs are now paying closer attention to the benefits you offer. Um, we're seeing people make decisions based on that. Have you seen that and how important is that in, in your industry? Oh, it's, it's all important. I mean, your job, pays you a salary and you can't live without it, but you also can't live without the benefits. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, healthcare is uh, the single most important element of of more way our employees look at benefits, but, but retirement benefits and the, even the smaller transportation benefits, just there's a whole range of things that, that influence employee decision making. And especially not, you know, ultimately competitive environment like Silicon Valley. And I don't want, and I need real talent. I need people who can think on their feet, not a foe afraid to show initiative. I need the people who are most coveted by any company. And yet I can't always necessarily pay them Google or, or Apple salaries. <laughs> but, but, the, but the combination of paying them a competitive salary and a stellar lineup of benefits does the trick, given the fact that we do, we are innovating and changing the world, which is, of course, key to most of my engineers' decision making. Well, that, that, that's what I was going to say. The, the mission and the culture you build uh, is what becomes addictive for some of these employees because you are changing the world. You are saving lives. Um, you know, y- your, your mission is critical, and it, it's great to see at least uh, the cyber knife scaling. And, and I want to ask you, you know, what are we going to see coming from Zap? Like, what are we going to, to, to witness, you know, in the next five years? Well, nothing less than world domination, Michael. So, um, <laughs> that's, <awesome. laughs> that's what, if any entrepreneur doesn't believe that they should probably step aside and let the next guy take over. So, um, you know, we're, we're growing business and we've got, 13 of our machines installed around the world and we got another 30 plus, you know, just waiting to be shipped and more orders coming in all the time and the technology is improving and getting faster and more ever more precise. So we're doing what a medical technology company should be doing um, and growing revenues and two or three years we expect to be profitable and, you know, ultimately have some sort of liquidity event. So all the, the good things from a business side but there is, uh, in the background, uh, 
an emerging mission that's coming out of what we're doing, and that's the uh, growing understanding, much of it coming out of the research that our company is driving, that shows that radiation can be used not just to kill tumors, but it can be used to alter the activity of pathological circuits in the brain. What do we mean by a pathological circuit? I mean the pathological circuits that cause like brain drug addiction, pathological circuits that cause, you know, uh, depression, obsessive compulsive wow. disease, uh, and even something like uh, obesity. So the biggest problems in the world today, biggest medical problems are not cancer and heart disease. They are the behavioral diseases that uh, uh, just plague us, plague humanity. And if you don't believe that, just wander the streets of many of these big urban centers and just see uh. how many people are, are destitute because of living sad, sad lives because of their psychiatric disorders. So we think that there's this precision radiation can change like a long-acting drug in a very specific area of the brain, the activity of the entire brain, and reverse many of these disorders. And this could be an utter revolution in the way we treat psychiatric disease. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Is that something that you're researching now? We have been researching in animal models for the last uh, five, six years, and we're going to start a clinical trial uh, in the, this coming year. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, again, just amazing work coming from your company. I, I, I want to pivot a little bit uh, because, you know, in your genes, I, I, I think uh, through your family members, they have this same inquisitive sort of knowledge base, uh, big idea, bold ideas. Um, and your son um, has started a company, Scribed. And and it really had to do with the fact that you've co-authored and authored over 300 different types of journals, articles, and it was difficult to get them all published in a timely manner. And he then came up with this idea. Can you talk to us about that? Because it, it's become a very successful, uh, you know, entrepreneurial startup. Yeah, my son Tripp has done well. So when he was uh, finishing up college, also at Harvard, um, he needed to figure out what to do in life. And uh, and I can tell you that working for big other big companies, he he did not enjoy or thrive in. And so he wanted to do a startup, and uh, he and his co-founder were looking around for some problem to solve. And, and I asked him, I invited him to try to solve what I was a problem for me was the, the medical journal uh, challenge, uh, how to make it easier to and less costly, more efficient. And uh, he was then just finishing college and he looked at the medical journal world and realized it was just much too complex and too much of a grown up problem at the time. But he quickly <laughs> pivoted to just uh, letting anyone publish anything on, on a website that uh, became scribbed and grew very quickly. And then, of course, it became even more sophisticated than that. It's now more like a, he would describe it as a Netflix for books. So, he, you know, almost all the books of the world can now be um, uh, read on his site for um, a low monthly fee of, I think it's $10. I don't want to support. But the point is, it's, yeah, he's had his so book awesome. run. <laughs> I sound like a TV infomercial. But so, no, uh, no, yeah. no. Well, I had to bring that up because it runs in the family. <laughs> hey, I have. I have no piece of his business, so it's all good, and I'm glad to see it be so <laughs> successful. And not only that, but my son-in-law, uh, who's in, uh, who's a medical oncologist at, at Johns Hopkins, he's just started a new pharma company here uh, a couple of months ago. So, yeah, startups are in the blood. No, that that that's fantastic. But the the work you're doing is so important. I really look forward to hearing about uh, what happens with your clinical trial relative to the behavioral. Uh, addressing the behavioral issues relative to the brain. I think that's, that's um, you know, very important, certainly, as you said, as you walk around even here in New York City, uh, you see the issues. And um, But everything you've done is really saving lives. You're making such a massive difference uh, to society. We, we see so much sort of negative news and 
um, you know, um, depressing news. And it's it's so important, I think, for us to share your story and the story of your company that really, truly is positive, is making a difference. Small businesses do this. They are under-recognized and hopefully, you know, through what we're doing here at Trinet, we're going to bring some life to that and share the stories that, that are positive and that are important. And, you know, John, it's so important uh, to hear your story and your company's stories. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for trying that for all you do for small business. We need your help. I want to remind everybody that our podcast, The People Force Podcast by Trinet, is committed to helping small to medium-sized businesses and their leaders with timely and relevant business content. The People Force Podcast drops new episodes every month, and we hope you continue catching our new episodes on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and arise.trinet.com. To get relevant SMB news and info, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and to our newsletter at trinet.com dot com backslash insights again trinet t-r-i-n-e-t dot com backslash insights <laughs>